that's a note on logistics. We're on a home stretch now, so if you could not leave your seats uh, when the panel leaves at the end of this session, we're going to go straight in, and it's going to basically be a one-way gate. The people can come in from the other panel, but you can't leave. Um, and, then, and then we're going to run straight into drinks. And that way you get your drinks roughly on time, as per the agenda, about 6.10, 6.15. Um, great. OK, so we, let, let's get kicking off. I think we've got all the panel in, 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 in place. So we've heard, I think, consistently through the day about how we can't do this alone, and we rely on partnerships across all sectors of society to get things done. Um, so it's great to have session five, the power of partnerships, stimulating collaborative and transactional partnerships for climate action. We actually have apologies uh, from Gonzalo. He's caught up with urgent matters with the COP presidency, which is um, a shame, obviously, and essential. Um, but it does give um, my moderate, our moderator here today, Ian de Cruz, global director of P4G, um, all the time until 4.55 uh, to do what he wants with the time. And just to remind everyone, you know, sort of uh, when, when we do open up for questions, questions, short sentence, question mark at the end. That'd be excellent. And uh, Ian reminds me, he's Australian, I'm Scottish, so um, you know, sort of, we're going we're gonna to be clear on that. Um, so with that, uh, over to Ian. Uh, on you go. Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, so with this session, I think what we really are looking at is um, how partnerships are driving action. Before we start in the context and introduce our esteemed panel, uh, we're going to start a little bit differently by asking, you've invested time to attend the session. What are some key questions you may have to help shape our conversation. And as part of that, I think an important voice that we want to hear in partnerships, which is also shaping this next decade of delivery and action, is the voice of youth. And, and I think, Chip, Barbara, you'd like to introduce a couple of colleagues who, who want to frame some of the thinking for us as part of the session. So over to you, Chip. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, my name is Chip Cummins, and I am uh, the chairman of the American Renewable Energy Institute, uh, an old colleague in front of Jens Nielsen, and so happy to be here for the 10th annual uh, World Climate Summit. I was at the first one. I'd like to um, bring up uh, some extraordinary young women, uh, some of the youth, uh, youth leaders of the global climate youth uh, uh, movement. And so if Sophie Shea and Alexandria, could you just step up here quickly? They're going to say a few words about what it means to make an intergenerational partnership. These uh, young ladies are quite extraordinary. They were principally responsible for organizing the uh, climate youth um, uh, march that took place in New York City uh, in September on the 20th, and over 350,000 people joined them and Greta. So maybe we could start with Xie, and maybe you could just come to the podium each at a time, introduce yourselves, and thank you. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alexandra Villasenor. I'm 14 and I'm from the United States. Over the past year, we have helped organize four global climate strikes in the United States. And personally, I've been on climate strike myself for 52 weeks, so an entire year, in front of the United Nations headquarters in New York City. We're here today to tell you that the youth of the Fridays for Future movement are holding corporations accountable on the climate crisis. Um, my name is Sophie Anderson. I'm one of the national coordinators of Extinction Rebellion Youth US. Um, and all of these millions of people that Alexandria talks about that have taken part in the climate strikes are also taking part in further action. Last June, Extinction Rebellion launched a campaign called Boycott Fashion, in which tens of thousands of people pledged to not buy anything new from the fashion industry for 52 weeks. And Basically, the average person spends 1,800 American dollars on new clothes each year. Multiply that by 10,000, that's an $18 million loss in revenue for the fashion industry. And this applies to all different sectors across all industries. Basically, if you don't take action, we are going to boycott. So now the question comes, oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Shia Bastida. I am uh, from Mexico, and I recently moved to the US, where I became a climate justice activist. We are here to tell you how you can actually partner with youth, because what you see from us is videos and pictures of us screaming out in the street and not actually being part of the conversation and decision making. So a way in which youth can partner with all of your businesses is through, one, internship, internships, 
in which you have black, brown, indigenous youth who have made climate solutions possible for their own communities. A second way in which you can actually have youth at the decision-making table is th through youth climate councils and advisory boards, where your company would create an advisory board that includes youth, uh, which would tell you actually what we want to see for your, um, from your carbon emissions and your goals and how to produce, produce your products and what youth are going to buy in the coming years as we become increasingly aware of the climate crisis. So I want to thank all of you for listening to the Voice of Youth today, and I hope that it influences your decision-making processes, because youth are partners whether you like it or not. Thank you. So thanks for that. So that's definitely one clear message, is how, do, how can youth be partners, and as we look forward to partnerships, bring that youth engagement in the co-creation of those partnerships. Quickly, are there any other questions that people have, not statements, but questions that you'd like the panel to address? Yes. Is there a roving mic? For, please. Uh, we'd like to ask if, uh, especially your mostly business and civil society leaders, whether you can really involve our own movement uh, of involving artists and media leaders so that we can be a conscientizing force to stop, help stop violence, as well as uh, the artists can provide uh, the instrument for creative empowerment, uh, especially of the youth, and also it has a healing power for a lot of victims that are traumatized with climate catastrophes Great. and armed conflict. Uh, generally, we okay, are absent thanks. I, I think in I've the got the point. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, any other points? Yeah. Hi, I'm Sandrine dixon Declev. I'm the president of the Club of Rome. And um, for those of you who don't know, the Club of Rome was started in 1968, so that's pretty much 50 years ago. Coming into the intergenerational dialogue, if we don't have time, then what does that mean for all of you in terms of partnerships, meaningful partnerships that have an impact in the next one, five, ten years so that we actually totally transform rather than just create incremental change? Thank you. Amy Christensen, Sun Valley Institute, and the founding program chair of the World Climate Summit way back. Um, my question is really, how do we create those partnerships between business and government to develop the policies at the national level and global level? I'm just seeing this disconnect between the private sector's leadership and government action and getting on board. They're always following business, we understand that, but what does that partnership really look like? What kind of dialogues do we need to be better having so that you all can share what actually works, what technologies are ready and practically, what are the best policies that you wanna see deployed to allow you to continue to accelerate action? So I just wanna see more practically what those partnerships and dialogues and conversations need to be to ex uh, rapidly accelerate government leadership to put a price on carbon primarily. Thank you. Great, we might have just one lucky last and then kick off the session. Hello, uh, Zubida from Morocco. Uh, I just wanted to ask the question about how technology can, uh, the partnership of technology uh, uh, providers uh, can uh, accelerate uh, uh, the, the, the plans about, uh, about uh, climate change, because we, I think that there is uh, not enough connection yet between uh, technology makers and the climate change uh, actors. Great, well thank you very much um, everyone. So we've got a nice context for this session and we are looking to speak about 20 minutes here, but then kick off the next round of questions so that this is an interactive section. So. My name's Ian De Cruz. I'm part of P4G. It's a long title. It's Partnering for Green Growth and Global Goals 2030. But in essence, our core is partnerships and finding those new business and finance models that can drive inclusive growth, sustainable development, and climate action. And Sandrine's point about the next decade is important, that this is where we have to, for high impact, we have to take high risk. 
and we talk in, in P4G about doing that in hyper-collaboration so that that speed and scale of the change and this critical window where we lock in our future in the next 10 years is critical to then the kind of partnerships approach we are looking to take and we'll be discussing with this panel. So I'll give three specific examples of the types of partnerships that hopefully give you a sense of what we do and, 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 and to kick off with the panel, some of their examples. So the first one is around electric buses in Latin America. And, and we think that it's really important that a lot of cities are now increasingly saying they want to have go down an electrification of buses, but at the moment, too much of it's done in a piecemeal way uh, at cities and, pil and piloting ways where cities say, well, we have special circumstances. But when you speak to the manufacturers, unless you're doing it at scale, they're not even interested. And also a question is, when will they pivot and actually see that the move from diesel buses to electric is what's required? And that's where the conversation from the youth are really important. Because if there is a social license to only operate in a certain way, and diesel buses is not given that social license, how will the automotive industry look to pivot in that context? And where that pivot may also mean you move from private ownership to shared ownership linked to public transport. These are the questions we ask. And then for the funders and investors here, you know, there is a need to co-create what are those new, new financing models. So with institutional investors, they're used to purchasing things in a certain way, but how do you start seeing and being part of this equation? One of the questions they say to us is the scale of, of, of contribution in terms of buses and the procurement lots have to be much bigger for them to be part of this market. And so that's a, an example of, an ele of a, a electric buses in Latin America where you take a partnership approach. If you look at the speed and scale that we're talking, there needs to be a lot of investment and for us, the core markets we work in is in developing countries, and that's where the, we see the significant opportunities to try these new business and finance models. So that hopefully gives you a sense and helps the panel to kick uh, off what they may be thinking of a part, uh, as partnership models. So um, if it's okay if I start with you, Marina, and then we'll work around the panel. Could you just introduce yourself and maybe give one specific example of the type of partnership model or approach you're, you're, you're utilizing um, with your corporate leaders group? Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, <clears throat> uh, my name is Marina Hermosilla. I'm Executive Director of Corporate Leaders Group in Chile, CIG. It's an organization that was created in the UK by Prince of Wales in 2005 with the aim to involve private uh, sector in, in um, the new policies, uh, the new um, awareness about climate change uh, would uh, come in the next uh, years. And he was uh, visiting Chile in 2009, and there were uh, interest, interest mm -hmm. from private sector to uh, found the organization there, and we are working in Chile from uh, 2009. Uh, we look for um, get involved private sector in public policies in order to boost the, um, the transition to a low carbon and resilient economy. And uh, we have, a, I think, a, a beautiful example uh, of partnership uh, last year in, in Chile. I don't know if I, I can explain it yeah. now. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, the, the government called for setting a table uh, in order to discuss with the private sector the um, decarbonization for the generation, el electricity generation in the country. And uh, the table was set uh, for uh, 10 or 12 months. Uh, in the beginning, it was very, very difficult to, to only to, to converse, uh, to talk, to, to, to make conversations in order to, because there were not really uh, um, confidence between the different actors. The private sector is not used to uh, be in the same table with the competitors and with the government. And um, at the end, um, 
with the information over the table, there was possible to make an agreement in order to have a decarbonization path uh, with the first uh, main um, centrals out of the system by uh, 2025 and uh, next steps until 2040. I think it was uh, very, very impressive for me. It was very impressive, the example, how private sector was able to um, talk about a very, very sensitive issue in the country. Uh, we have uh, more than 40% of the electricity uh, generated by, by um, fossil fuels. So uh, the carbonization path is a very, very uh, big um, uh, ambition. And they were able to build confidence and to get an agreement in less than a year. I think in this case, the, the, the clue was um, confidence, uh, trustful between the actors. Great. Thanks very much, Marina. And I think it's a good example as we are set into COP26 of the way that companies can play a leading role in the creation of these targets and in the implementation. And I think we've seen in many countries where if that's done in a bipartisan way, then it doesn't become politicized, where then what you have is a back and forth of the system. So it's a clear strategic direction of a path that over time should get bipartisan support with that corporate buy-in. So thank you, Marina, for that example. Um, as we move to Nanette, I think you've got a very specific um, granular example of, of, of an outcome that has also been successful in the refrigeration. So, yes. Nanette, if you could introduce yourself. And Thank the you. Uh, Nanette Lockwood with Ingersoll Rand. Uh, you know, primarily our train and Thermo King brands are our climate brands. So, uh, it's air conditioning and transport refrigeration. And so, we have been involved in lots of different governments over lots of different issues. But the one example I would use is really um, been the most effective I've ever seen, and that's the Montreal Protocol. And it was just amended to include HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons, which you know have thousands of times more global warming potential than CO2, right? So we use those as refrigerants, as foams. And of course, it impacts a lot of different industries, but the Montreal Protocol has a very unique history in that they're trying to solve a problem in almost real time. So, you know, back in late 80s, we had the ozone hole, and, you know, it's been the most successful environmental treaty ever. And so now that it's going to ad address HFCs, you know, there was a lot of discussion early on, but it was very clear to us, the private sector, and we were always invited to observe, similar to the COPs, uh, and we always had side events, and we always had discussions with governments, but it was very clear that the governments needed to take action, and that they didn't know how to take action. And so we even worked with the Secretariat, and she organized all these technical workshops, and we were able to actually talk about what's possible in such a way that we didn't get into competitive issues, but we could highlight the fact, and it really became a competition over who could talk about how to solve the issues you know, the first and um, most global. So I think that has really helped. We are now seeing transitions well ahead of the time frame set by the Kigali Amendment. And it is, um, it's very encouraging to those of us who moved first. So being part of those discussions is important, having the governments all zeroing in on the type of problems they want to solve and inviting our opinions and technical knowledge is the most important thing that we've seen. Thank you so much, uh, Nanette. Um, Benoit, the, the question was raised about policy, how can that be done with national countries and with an element of technology? And I think you have some good examples of what's emerging in your work. Well, thank you. I represent an organization based in Paris called the International Partnership for Energy Efficiency Cooperation. So talking about partnership, we have that in our name. We have even cooperation. And we have energy efficiency because this is a missing fuel to solve climate change. We are not failing on climate change because of lack of investment in renewable energy. We are failing because there is not understanding and investment in energy efficiency. And this is why 10 years ago, the G8 
said that among all the options we have for uh, supply of energy in this world, we didn't, there was no platform to discuss energy efficiency. So they put in place this International Partnership for Energy Efficiency Corporation. It's a platform of governments of the largest economies, typically the G20. So far, we have 17 of the G20 countries taking part in this conversation. So first step, we exist, and this exists. Uh, second, there is much, much more that is needed to really make an impact, because what we are facing is uh, uh, a need to seriously scale up energy efficiency at all levels, everywhere, in every country, in every end use. And a, government, a, a partnership of government is maybe the first step. But it is an important one. This organization reports to the G20. The G20 itself, it's the future of the governments of this world. The UN is a nice organization with close to 200 countries. Doesn't, it's heavy, difficult to take decision to that. Yes, we have the Paris Agreement, but you know, after so many uh, failures and efforts. But you take the G20 country, you have 20 countries in the room, 80% of anything. Greenhouse gas emission, GDP, energy efficiencies, and potential saving, and so on. So there is this idea that uh, by having the right level of partner around the table, you can uh, maybe achieve something. But I am also witnessing a partnership that uh, doesn't have any rules. There is no permanent secretary of the G20. The G20, we all feel that it is the most important forum to guide us in the, in the better direction in this world, but it's interesting for me to see that uh, uh, the G20 is uh, the result of uh, every year there is a change of the, uh, of the G20, and um, we are building, we all feel that we need it, but more has to uh, be uh, done to make it operational, and I'm sure that most of you, you have never heard about this organization, IPIC, and maybe you don't pay too much attention to the G20, but we should. Three concrete collaborations currently organized under this International Partnership for Energy Efficiency Collaboration. A collaboration on the Internet of Things. We are all convinced that digitalization is part of the solution, and we need to see more digitalization. But digitalization comes with a cost. There's a cost on energy demand, and no country in the world alone can impose on the manufacturers of this Internet of Things and Connection can impose some energy performance obligation to make sure that we don't add uh, more energy in, in a space. So we have a concrete collaboration called Connected Device Alliance where it's a dialogue between the global industry of this Internet of Things and the government, and slowly, with uh, some uh, discussion, there is some proposal being formulated to the G20 to maybe encourage the G20 to adopt a principle to set common action. We have a second task group on transport. Not cars, but heavy duty vehicles. Until very recently, no country had any energy efficiency regulation on trucks. And the US started to introduce one, and we have now a G20 task group dedicated to just this field. 10% of the fleet of road transport, 48% of the greenhouse gas emission of road transport come from trucks. Now there is a platform through which the global industry plus some international organization under the umbrella of the G20 is collaborating. So it is just an illustration of what could be done. Much more is needed, but at least I'm e trying to explain that uh, things exist. And the last example I'd like to share is this task group that brings together the energy efficiency community, so some of you, with the finance community. We need to double investment in renewable energy by 2040. We need to multiply by five to eight the level of investment in what we call energy efficiency. This is huge. This is massive. And this is not happening at the scale of what we need to see. One of the reasons is that the financial institution, the investors, 
you and me as individuals, we don't invest, despite we know it could be cost effective, despite we know that will generate some uh, greenhouse gas reduction at negative cost. We don't do it because there is a lack of many things. So anyway, we have this uh, G20 Energy Efficiency Finance Task Group uh, offering a platform where we have a dialogue between the government, the financial institution, to just better understand what could be done, should be done. So much more is needed, but uh, this is just an illustration of what international partnership is currently doing on energy efficiency, and uh, certainly more to be shared later. Great. So thanks for those lessons learned, Benoit. Um, Ralph, I know you've spoken on a couple of panels, so probably we can get straight to it and maybe give an example um, in terms of partnership models, either you've been experiencing or part of your industry, which you think has been really successful. Happy to do so, and uh, probably no need to introduce myself, so, uh, but anyway, Head of Sustainability Volkswagen Group. Um, in terms of partnerships and successful partnerships, and I'd like to pick up basically three questions wi which we got from the audience. The, the, the question was, what about meaningful partnerships? Which partnerships can really accelerate change? And also the question around technology partnerships, so, so which, which, what is the role of technology? And, I'd like to pick one, one example, and it's not, not too long, but this is a partnership um, between Volkswagen and the city of Hamburg, which just was renewed uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, so it's already lasting for, I think, uh, two years, and we just extended it. Because when talking about the change and accelerate change, one thing is having uh, the right political boundary conditions. And we're doing a lot of things and also talking to governments and saying, how can we make that transformation towards e-mobility happen? What needs to happen in terms of infrastructure? What needs to happen into, in terms of building laws that people are allowed to build in charging stations in, in their underground parking lots and not one single owner can block it for the anti-community. So one thing is the regulatory frameworks. The other thing is once you have frameworks, you still have to try out things. You have to do pilots and really uh, figure out does it really work or doesn't it work and um, with this partnership with Hamburg we have multiple examples uh, as part of this partnership so on the one hand we are piloting autonomous driving so we're using city of Hamburg as a real-life test case for autonomous vehicles um, then Hamburg in terms of talking infrastructure heavy haul transport um, Hamburg has a big harbor the port um, we are piloting autonomous um, moving of uh, heavy trucks in this port area, which uh, is electrified. Uh, so that's, that's another thing. Third thing is um, we have a ride-sharing service called Moya. So it's um, somewhere in between public transport and, and taxi, more or less. So minibuses with up to seven participants. Um, running um, along virtual stops and you can via an app book it. Um, so, so that's another story where currently 100 of these Moya vehicles are running in Hamburg and we just uh, agreed to expand it to 500 vehicles next year. Uh, so it's, it's using this big city of Hamburg as a real life laboratory and, and um, really trying out things, what works and this is to be honest an excellent partnership which we have because we see real-life real results and not only PowerPoints or some written declarations. Yeah. Thanks very much, Ralph. So um, as we look to the next round of questions um, from, from yourselves, one of the things I'd like the panel to also talk about, which you've started to, is also what are some of the lessons learned from partnerships? It's an easy word to say, but you know, all of us involved in it can see that it is very tough. So as we look to answer the next question, some of the lessons learned painful or otherwise in terms of partnerships that we've all had. So um, that would be really helpful to share. But I'll open up to the floor again for the next round of questions. And again, uh, just reminding Peter's point, uh, not statements, specific questions and succinct ones. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Meredith Adler. I'm the executive director of Student Energy. So we're a group of 50,000 young people in 150 different countries, very focused on energy careers as a climate solution. Um, and so my question to you all is really this, is that part of what young people are really calling for within the climate movement is actually a move towards global equity as we move towards the energy transition and transi 
transitioning systems more holistically. So how are you thinking about that in the future of your work and leveraging the knowledge of young people and their ability to collaborate globally, like their ability to mobilize and influence governments right now? Good afternoon, I'm Julia. I'm a journalist from Comunicarse, an Argentinian media that now has uh, an office in Chile. Um, I would like to know um, how can you um, overcome the challenges between the talk of the public sector and the private sector? Because we know they talk in two different languages. Uh, they have different needs. So how can you overcome these challenges when you talk some, uh, some issues that are urgent and challenges on us, climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a project developer from Mexico, but I represent uh, the Latin American chapter uh, for sustainability at the Rotary International Movement, uh, which I hope you are aware of. Uh, and uh, I have seen a lot of uh, efforts in, in, in clubs all, all over Latin America. Uh, s repeated projects of reforestation, river cleaning, uh, oceans cleaning, and so, and it's very indep independent efforts. Is there a way you have been working with or have, or have an idea how to deal with as a group, the Rotary International or Latin America and Rotary, with uh, one of those uh, initiatives. Thank you. Okay, I think there's a couple at the back. Okay. So we'll take maybe two more and that have this as a round and go through the panel. Hello, my name's Wendy Miles. Just a question about private, oh, I'm a lawyer. A question about private to private partnerships. And take Volkswagen, for example, moving into um, lithium, um, sort of entering into contracts with lithium mines. How, if at all, are you exploring private to private partnerships in the learnings that the mining industry, for example, has developed over the last 50, 60 years in terms of sustainable development, environmental, human rights issues, and making sure that when OEMs or other private players don't repeat those mistakes as they enter the industry in a transitional market? There was just one more at the back, yeah. My name is Naveed, I'm at Vermont Law School. Um, my question is, how do you, you've mentioned a lot about partnerships and a lot about commitments that partnerships make together. But in terms of um, some of the challenges that was addressed in the previous question, how do you make sure those commitments are followed through? Um, and how do you, as, as within the onset of the partnership, ensure that the commitment will be seen through and there are, even if there are exit strategies, there are strategies, there are exits that are made in a way that, that does not sort of take away from the initial commitment. Great, so great set of questions um, to, the, to the panel and um, I'll just kind of work back from the other order. So maybe start with Ralph and you can pick away through the panel some of the uh, questions which were raised here as well. So, Ralph. All righty. Since, since one of the questions was specifically directed to us, uh, I'd, I'd like to start with this one. Um, and on, let's say, private-private partnerships, um, since the initial question was on private-public partnerships, I didn't touch base on these, but they are more important than ever for us because the transformation we are facing is affecting complete value chains, so really talking to our tier one, two, three, four, five suppliers in order to de decarbonize, for example, value chains and also uh, take care more than ever in terms of human rights issues, uh, labor practice and all these things. The other one is, um, I mean, we're talking about new ecosystems also on the, on the solution side with digitalization and electrification of, of the industry. So there's complete new ecosystems and uh, when talking about ecosystems, everyone wants to own the platform, but uh, it ain't going to work if every single participant wants to own the platform and maximize its benefits. So, <coughs> so it's also there really about an honest discussion on probably open source approaches, 
slash also having having joint agreements how to how to deal with these partnerships and specifically on on the for example lithium and and mining industry uh, experience uh, basically my an my answer is twofold on the one hand every single manufacturer is always depending on the supply chain and the sub suppliers so so yes um, automotive industry and many others are depending on mining companies for decades because they always have been supplying steel and copper and these materials and obviously there hasn't been too much attention by the public and sometimes also not by the companies on topics in the supply chain. <coughs> um, we have established strict supplier standards for our tier one suppliers but we are also following the entire value chain taking lithium, taking cobalt and other battery constituents first in order to create full transparency and then is really forwarding standards and since we don't have a contractual relationship with the tier 5 suppliers then we're talking about joint collaboration in industry initiatives such as the global battery alliance of world economic forum where we have mining companies intermediates battery cell manufacturers and automotive OEMs because we can solve many can solve many issues only in collaboration. Um, so that's one approach we have to join forces sometimes also with competitors. And then your question was on holding accountable and following up on on the on the results or the, let's say how commitments are kept. And I can give you well, one formalized answer is that, in fact, in our department and within our company, we just defined a process to follow up on voluntary commitments. Because sometimes companies say, say things and we are going to do this, and then it's in a press release and nobody ever follows up. And we just introduced a formalized process also to, to really keep track on these things and held the right people accountable and also to, to organize and, and structure who is allowed to say what because credibility in this entire thing is key and we are really working on, on that one as well. So probably leaving the other question for the other panelists and step in again later. Thanks, Raoul. Benoit? I can only uh, share from my field energy efficiency, but I think it's a nice illustration of what we need to, to do anyway. Um, it takes time to build partnership, and this is one of the lessons I'm learning from my work. And in fact, we need to build a world of knowledge. We need to move towards an economy of knowledge. We come from an economy of finite resources. We need to move to an economy of infinite resources. Finite resources, fossil fuel, they are finite. Land, minerals. And we need to move a world of infinite resources, energy efficiency, renewable energy, knowledge, education, friendship, love. The rule is to be understood. The rule is that the finite resources, the more you share, the less you have. And the result is immediate. The more you share, the less you have. And it is immediate. Infinite resources, where we need to move the whole world. The more you share, the more it grows. When I share my knowledge with your knowledge, we are both more knowledgeable. Same for energy efficiency, same for renewable energy. The more we invest, the more it grows. Building friendship and love, the more you share, the more it grows. Except it takes time. So this is one of the big lessons I've learned over time, that to build this partnership, we need the means to make it happen. So we need to have a common vision in order to build a trust and this doesn't ha uh, happen over time. And we have to accept a learning curve here. We have to accept that to change some of the fundamentals of our economies, it will take time. And um, I often see that we are always looking at short-term things, investment of any sort. But if we don't put in place the framework the platform, the forum with the right rules and put the time line horizon at the level of what we, we are not going to deliver. It takes time to build a common narrative around what climate change means to us. I can see on energy efficiency, it's not understood energy efficiency. We don't have a common narrative among the energy efficiency community. How can we expect climate change community to understand what we can offer? 
Anyway, big lessons for me means trust and time. And uh, I wish we could understand that and bring that to uh, this. Uh, the future is ours as long as it will be a, a future of economy of knowledge above all. Great, thanks. And love. Wow, and it's so passionate. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, we've had a lot of lessons learned, and you know, we, we set our first climate commitment in 2014, and we, we kind of had an idea of what we were going to do. But what was really interesting is our, our leadership took an incredible role in making sure that it was going to happen. He set a level zero metric, and for those of you who are not in the private sector, that means that uh, if we don't meet our targets, we don't get bonuses. So, and, it, and the workforce was incredibly engaged and excited at the same time. So, uh, you know, when we met those targets and they set new targets, which were, you know, incredibly um, more ambitious, you know, what we've really learned through this is that we have to leverage all of our employees to try to figure out how to, f how to design something that's going to do what we need to do, but we have to reach beyond our own boundaries. And it can't just be us. We work with suppliers. We work with chemical suppliers to try to design refrigerants for our equipment. We're not chemical people, but we use their products, and we have to make sure that it's going to be the most sustainable product that we can get our hands on. And if we don't take action and try to make it happen, it does not happen. And we end up stuck with whatever they put on the market. Same thing with um, all of our products, really. And so we partner with our supply chains to help them understand. And really, first and foremost, we have to educate them. We have to create some sort of sense of urgency, and we have to set the bar. Because it's not going to happen if you don't do it. And as a first mover, it makes it very difficult. But we've seen incredible rewards. We educate our customers. You know, we've invested in low carbon technologies for quite a while now. And we're selling them in, uh, you know, at least the first ones in over 30 countries without regulation. That means we've educated them. And just like energy efficiency, you know, the, the common practice for the minimum energy performance standards, you know, those are 40% less efficient than some of the products on the market. You have to educate your customers, your suppliers, and the regulators and everybody about the value. When they see value, they will invest. Thanks for that, uh, Nanette. And I think part of that value and what we're hearing of, the, of consumers is also changing in terms of what value they, they're seeing. Um, so, Marina, would you like to ans um, answer some of the other questions? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I will uh, came again over the the um, the importance of building trust in and having a, a common um, vision about the 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 objective and the the path to um, obtain it and uh, it takes time to uh, understand the vision of the others and uh, the importance of uh, share common information in order to build not only a common vision but a, a, a common path to and um, uh, around around the 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 um, uh, the collaboration you can uh, get some uh, ways to uh, obtain the um, the the objective uh, easier i think for us one of the most important things in in all of these years working in a public um, 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 uh, private policy uh, partnership has been building trust with the government and with the and with the others and uh, to share information uh, is one of the i think uh, more important things we have learned um so a, one, a couple of questions which we haven't answered is one about how do we actively bring youth i think into it um, how do you bring an element of equity in? And I'll give you a couple of examples of partnerships. I'm still thinking of how we bring artists in. And so if anyone on the panel has good ideas about 
examples practically of how artists are collaborating in your partnership solution, that'd be great. But at least from a P4G perspective, a couple of points is we're seeing new business and finance models from equity where you're seeing impact investors in this partnership called Energize Africa, where investors in UK, Netherlands, for sums like $50 can actually invest in small medium enterprises with energy solutions in parts of Africa. And so you're seeing even within structures you know, the, the deconstruction of what the finance sector is, the development sector, and then how you can have some immediacy uh, in terms of the contribution and investment at a small scale, but to solutions. And so I think as we see supply chains, Ralph mentioned this, and you know, how that value chain is becoming more transparent of who's actually capturing that value and how that can be actually a two-way exchange between countries, between sectors, that's emerging. A personal example of how we're bringing youth into our work in partnerships is that as we look at these next generation partnerships, we're actively building into our summits and into our partnership creation. How can youth and in universities in our 12 partner countries be part of those partnership solutions, participate as part of those voices, but use some of our new business and finance models to signal to young entrepreneurs where these emerging opportunities are. And so that's a way for us to actually we think we're building um, the, the business leaders in 2030 and work back. So how do we nurture over those 10 years um, in very actionable and systematic ways that follow through? So hopefully that gives you a sense of it. Um, I just am conscious that we have to finish at 4.55. So I think what I'd like to do go, is go through for each of the panel to give one last word about to this group, what's one partnership um, idea or model that you're excited to be part of implementing in 2020 and may invite um, others to be part of that journey with you. And I might start with you, Marina, if that's OK. Um, I would like to see a partnership between uh, customers and, and companies. Uh, I don't know if partnership is the best uh, word for, for uh, calling that, but um, uh, I, I would like to see how the 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 vision of the uh, the the youth principle uh, um, in the youth as a customers can uh, lead a new way of um, um, uh, massive products, a new way of uh, production, and how you can work together in order to uh, build a new. Uh, um, um, uh, supply chain uh, with different uh, values about how to uh, make products. And uh, I don't know if, if partnership is the, the best uh, word for calling that, but uh, the, the, the way that customers can lead the change in order to be able to communicate, not only by voting uh, with the, with the, um, uh, um, by buying, but by not buying too, I think. I think we heard some of the voice of youth of what they will and will not purchase. I mean, one of the partnerships we're looking at is in the apparel industry where the statistic is 1% of textiles actually reused as part of the my, my cycle and 80% um, is, is goes to landfill. So, you know, it's examples of significant changes that we can all be part of the solution. Okay, Nanette. Okay, so one of the most recent and most exciting partnerships that we have been involved in is called Cooling as a Service. And basically it's a financial model where we're working with governments um, in conjunction with uh, KSEP, which is one of the uh, programs under the Montreal Protocol Kigali Amendment. And we're working with different governments to make sure that we put the most efficient cooling systems in buildings. And what it does is it, the building owners no longer buy the equipment. We own the equipment, they just lease it, they pay for the cooling itself. So it really drives the most efficient solution and it maintains uh, operation because we have to maintain it to make sure it's performing well. And it guarantees that owners are getting, uh, or the, the people in the building are getting what they pay for. 
the next G20 presidency in 2020 is the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And I'm very pleased to see that Saudi Arabia has ensured that energy efficiency will be part, it will be one of the hottest topics to be discussed at the G20 of the energy ministers. And that, that gives me a lot of hope because I uh, see a series of our task group from uh, finance to uh, appliances, from data to, uh, to transport, feeding the G20 process. And you know, when there's a G20 in Germany or in Japan like this year, if there's some message on energy efficiency, yes, you expect that. But um, I, can, uh, I would hope that this year we will uh, uh, be able to shape uh, some uh, strong message from the G20 for our communities. So watch that space and uh, hopefully uh, one year, in one year from now uh, we could be able to report some strong message, concrete proposal to promote energy efficiency further in the climate change because of uh, Saudi's uh, leadership on the field including on um, cooling. I expect to bring cooling as a service at the heart of uh, one of the G20 recommendations next year. We shall discuss. Ralph. All right. I, I, I still wonder if we captured your question, Meredith, correctly, if it was about equity or was it about equality and justice? Um, so I didn't, I still have to follow up with you on that. Um, but probably both go sometimes together. Um, in terms of partnership for 2020 onwards, um, my key message here is we have to have partnerships in order to scale up good solutions and really create scale effects for the transformation. And to give you one example, um, this year we, we um, signed a partnership with Ford, uh, also supporting each other in terms of, for example, licensing uh, out our uh, modular electric um, toolkit, so the drivetrain for electric vehicles, and on the other hand, also partnering in terms of light commercial vehicles, which, which we get from Ford. So mutual par or partnerships for mutual benefits that help us to scale up are important. Second example is um, also this year um, we signed a partnership with a, a Scandinavian um, startup called Northvolt, and we are now building um, a manufacturing pilot plant for batteries um, in Salzgitter in Germany, so Hanover area in order to scale up battery manufacturing also in-house and not to be only dependent on, on other partners. So, so that's really about building partnership to scale up things that drive transformation. So I think in conclusion, I'm looking forward to is that um, I've got a privileged job that I see some of the coolest business and finance models out there, but um, we're having a summit next year in, in Korea at the end of June where we want to see some of our partnerships from 2018, 2019 come to life uh, and, and really prove that there are these partnerships that we all talk about and harness that as a showcasing moment. I think in summary, you know, within the panel, I think that Marina talked about trust, the trust between corporate and governments to actually develop and co-create those national targets to ensure you get that support, not only um, in the interim, but, but in the longer term. I think, you know, Nanette has given an example that when we're faced back to the wall, um, governments and, and business can innovate in the Montreal Protocol. So. Um, we are in a climate crisis, but there are uh, analogues where this has been done and we pulled ourselves out of it. I think the Benoit's talked about love, which is very important that this concept of love and trust, if we want to hyper-collaborate while we need time, what we've seen in our experiences is that ability to trust and know that the people and the partners you have really have that concept of love and not narrowly defined version of self-interest at heart is actually critical to finding out who a good partner is. And I think Ralph said, you know, we have to experiment. We're all on a learning journey and um, we have to do that quickly. So uh, thank you very much for a really engaging session panel and for your questions. Peter, over to you. And, and bonus points for that panel for not only finishing on time, just a minute or two early. It's a one-way gate, remember. Only people are allowed in, nobody here is allowed to move. Um, so seriously, you can go if you need, if you need. but uh, the closing session is just coming up in the next um, minute or two, um, so I'm going to le leave a minute for them to be able to join us from the other hall. The closing session is Business for 2030, Bridging the Gap in Finance and Technical Capacity Necessary to make, Meet the Challenges of Climate Change. We are going to uh, be uh, opening with a keynote from Cyril Garcia, CEO of Capgemini Invent. So Cyril, if you, if you want to come up and get ready, um, and then everyone else is coming in now, I can see them coming in.
Okay, muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Cyril Garcia. I'm the CEO of Capgemini uh, Invent. And what is Capgemini Invent? It's a consultant firm made of uh, 7,000 colleagues all over the world, uh, inventive colleagues, I guess, and I hope, uh, trying to define what's next for our clients, private companies, administrations, uh, funds, um, banks, and we are all part of Capgemini Group. This being said, it's a, it's a true honor to, to, uh, to introduce this uh, last session of the day. This session will be uh, creative and, uh, and concrete on how to bridge the gap to meet the business challenges of climate change by 2030, or maybe before 2030. Because working closely uh, all over the world with uh, four leaders, four challengers, for newcomers, for historical players, we acknowledge that our clients are facing unique and, and sometimes, I would say, pretty uh, dramatic changes. Their business models will, uh, will be disrupted and they will have to, to adapt, to invent, to reinvent, or to die in the five to next, uh, to five to next 10 years. And on top of the um, climate change, there are two, I would say, fundamental uh, reasons. The first one is the formidable acceleration of the technology innovation, which makes the sector convergence possible. We are now in a world without walls between sectors, more and more. And it will be reinforced by the constant innovation, by the 5G popping up, by the development of Internet of Things. And second, the new social contracts are emerging, answering new expectations in terms of uh, redistribution, in terms of uh, ways of working. So you see the combination of those three strong energies. We will have, because nosotros también, we'll have to adapt, to invent, to reinvent ourselves, but the key question is how it will happen, and it's at the heart of the session. What will be the drivers, the, the engines of those uh, new uh, models? And we see three main uh, drivers. The first one is uh, cross-sector fertilization. Uh, I, I prefer to say uh, pollination of, uh, of innovation. It's happening for real. As you saw, the second element in the previous session, strong ecosystem new form of uh, global collaboration and new powers of uh, partnership. And the third one, where I think we need to be uh, blunt and, uh, and probably less politically correct, is some radical changes of paradigm and new business models, and I will come back with some examples. So cross-sector pollination, a lot of bees on this page, as you see, it's a, it's a great concept, and it's, uh, frankly, it's happening for real. And let's start with the, the energy sector in the middle, the big B. Uh, it has accumulated over the, the, the years strong uh, climate assets. And in this sector, historical energy uh, players want to diversify their services toward other sectors, and they want to, to leverage their, uh, what they call, what we call the 3D strategy, decarbonization, decentralization, and digitization. But more importantly, I think we have a strong adoption by uh, other sectors to develop and to operate by themselves their uh, own system, their own anti-waste programs, their mobility solutions, and their battery network, and so on and so forth. And so we have uh, initiated a tracking of uh, carbon uh, emission savings because behind all these uh, projects there is uh, and there are green uh, big cases and, uh, and the Pope of this uh, consolidation in this room, Mr. Florent Andrian, to make sure that we talk about true decarbonation and not fake. So new forms of global collaboration are now massively uh, impactful. So probably for years this notion of ecosystem was something a little bit, you know, 
not too pragmatic. But now again, the surge of those new ecosystems is for real. It's fed by technology, data, AI, and of course, billions, billions of venture investment. And it's a true game changer. We pointed here uh, in the little clouds uh, at least uh, three of them. I'd like to mention energy transition as a strong ecosystem, smart cities, uh, e-mobilities, and those ecosystems are truly polarizing the efforts of uh, all those uh, stakeholders, government, corporate, startup, citizen, academics. The outcomes are tangible in terms of uh, distributed production, in terms of decarbonization, and in terms of uh, digitization. What is interesting to, to, to note here is that the, those ecosystems are becoming more consumer-centric versus very focused on the supply side uh, uh, years ago. And just let me uh, refer to two of them. Uh, Techstar Energy Accelerator in Norway, which is incubating startup focused on energy transition. And uh, another one, Inno Energy, which is a fund uh, focused on energy transition and clean tech. So cross-sector pollination, dynamic ecosystems, those uh, engines are now delivering, if I, if I may say. But brutal changes brutal changes of paradigm still need to happen, and we need to break, to break if, if I take an image, some totem and some taboo. And yes, we can't no more play with fake value propositions. And I like to take the example of the so-called client experience in the B2C uh, space promoted by all our industry. Uh, we need must be honest with ourselves, consultants, IT providers. This client experience, as it is designed today, is burning the planet. Because the promise of um, immediacy, instantaneity, in the relation between the, the, the customer and the provider is truly burning the planet. So we need to uh, invent new ways to satisfy the end customer satisfaction of the end customer will remain a standard. But what can we do? Revising the supply chain, optimizing the supply chain, frankly, is useless and will be useless if we don't break this taboo of the customer experience. So we need to find new angles, probably more uh, purpose-driven, and, uh, and that's a challenge uh, for us. As you see on the next slide, uh, we can't uh, any more finance the world as it is any longer and uh, we will not advise the world as it is any longer. Our promise, uh, and this is uh, for us, uh, and, uh, and behaviors will have to change and are uh, already changing. So that's, that's the reason why we have um, created within Capgemini Invent for Society. It's um, not only a change of uh, a mindset, but uh, it's a management decision, a management decision to drive our business by the purpose. We will continue, of course, to, to serve uh, the automotive sectors, consumer products, retails, telco, but we will influence, we will track care, environment. We have to monitor, we have to make sure that our business has a meaning for the planet and we will report it. So uh, that's not, uh, that's not an, uh, only a purpose, and it's uh, happening now. Thank you for this uh, quick introduction, and uh, looking forward to, to meet you at the cocktail after the session. Thank you. Okay, for our last, last panel of the day, I'd just like to invite up uh, Sandrine Dixon de Clef, president of the Club of Rome, and her panel. Thank you very much, Peter. It's so nice to see so many people here. And now I'm going to wake you up a little bit. 
because although we did hear some wonderful partnership stories, it's far too little. And I'm getting slightly frustrated having now become the president of the Club of Rome and realizing that for the last 50 years, we've been talking but not doing enough that all of you who are sitting here and go back to your lovely corporate positions and your comfortable world don't really listen to what the young people who were in here before actually said. And the reason I'm saying that is not to make you feel guilty, but it is to light a bit of fire under your ass. Because the fact of the matter is that we are people in a climate emergency, and the fact is that actually what's happening in the blue zone right now does not reflect that emergency. In fact, I keep on receiving horrid stories of the lack of collaboration, the fact that we still can't get an agreement on carbon markets, the fact that actually what we're saying here, the great partnerships that we have are nowhere near the scale that we need them to be, nor is the political will to actually shift all of this lovely talk that we've been having for the 25 last COPs into action for the next 10 years, because that's all we have, is a decade. So what I want to do with this next panel is get real. And I'm sorry to put you all on the spot. Cap Gemini gave a very good opener into saying that we're nowhere where we need to be today. And that if we're going to get to tomorrow, that we need to do something very fast. We need to scale up. We need to bring in some speed in order to have success. That's what I call S cubed. We need to move into an intergenerational dialogue now so that we actually co-create solutions. Not that we just have our token youth come up and say a few words and then leave. Not that we just have one woman on the panel or one African or one young person, but actually that they are part of the decision-making process. We need to ensure that from now on, every single decade, we cut our greenhouse gases by 50%. That is a huge task. And to be frank, none of us should be here, because the air miles alone and the CO2 that we've all burned, hopefully most of it offset, but most of it probably isn't, is part of the problem. We should be Zooming, we should be using actually IT, we should be ensuring that we're totally connected. Connected both in terms of digitalization, but connected in terms of strategic decisions that we make on a daily level. Because this is a pre-war Marshall Plan. This is what we call at the Club of Rome, emerging from emergency. To emerge from emergency, you must act as if you're in emergency. You must bring in the guards. You must bring in the firefighters. How is it possible that right now in Australia, those fires are burning and no one can put them out? And that when someone does, like Leo DiCaprio, try to put out a fire in Brazil, he's accused of lighting a fire. How is it possible that we can continue to listen to these fake facts and allow them to happen, or the hate. Someone mentioned love on the last panel. We sure need a heck of a lot of it, but loving also means that we all need to work together in order to truly find solutions that for some may be losing out and others may be the winners. So I would like to ask my panel to come up. Amal Liamin, Carlos Sali Alonso, Hervé Duteil, and Bertrand Picard, all of which have different solutions. And think about the following. Please come up. Hi. 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 Good. Welcome. Let's take some successes, because I'm not just going to be the doomsday messenger here. OK? We had a pledge in August from the EIB indicating very clearly that they were going to pull out of fossil energy. For two months, the EIB was actually blocked in its decision by many member states in the European Union. But the success is that they got it through. So can we have a clap for the EIB, the largest public lender 
who has pulled out of any new fossil energy lending. What happened? On Monday, Christine Lagarde was in the European Parliament and I had the chance to speak to her. And what did she say? Climate is now par and parcel of the way in which the ECB looks at its portfolio. Can we please have a round of applause for the ECB? We know the MDBs are going to do the same. We know that they're following. We know that the central banks are stress testing, are de-risking. We know that we now have a taxonomy that just got approved in the European Commission with the European Parliament and also the Council. And for those of you who don't know what the heck a taxonomy is, the taxonomy is the new codification of what green projects could be. So we are on a roll in some ways. But we need to spruce it up. We need more. And that is what this is going to be about. That, this conversation is how can we make it work? How can we get those pipelines of projects together? And how can we move forward faster? So maybe I'm going to, as we were talking about the MDBs, I'm going to start to talk with you, Amal. Give me a little bit your impression of how we can actually match finance. And I know how much you've been doing because we were at the MDB session actually in New York in September together. Give me a little bit of impression of how we can really make it faster and more fruitful. So first of all, I also want to congratulate EIB. Um, having uh, seen uh, their approach towards that commitment, it was for me critical that they could agree that because if the European Bank could not agree to that, then there would be no hope probably for other multilateral development banks. So uh, huge congratulations to EIB, very well done. Um, so I think, I mean, we're seeing this in different ways, but we're increasingly starting to work more with ministries of finance and planning on this agenda. Uh, and in fact, uh, supporting Latin American Caribbean governments with many of the objectives that have been set out under the coalition of um, ministers of finance that will be meeting tomorrow. And, launching the Santiago Action Plan. And we see that really as uh, a really key way of being able to drive and accelerate what we need in terms of transformational change. No longer, it is no longer good enough to be looking at picking out a nice project here and there, and you know, which is clearly incremental. But actually, how do we drive transformational change across the economy, across all sectors? Clearly, only really ministries of finance and planning and economy can, can drive through all sectors and have that very catalytic effect. So we're working with them in several ways. Uh, a key one is to work with them to integrate climate change and sustainability issues. And I do want to also congratulate the COP here for being a blue cop, and also this very strong focus on nature-based solutions because we have to break down the silos. We need a holistic approach. Uh, we need to do everything now. It's not about trying to do uh, just renewable energy over there and a bit of energy efficiency. We really need to drive sustainability across the economy. And so we're working with ministries of finance to integrate that into their budget planning and investment planning, which can be a very powerful way of aligning their public financial flows with what they have committed to under the Paris Agreement. Uh, we're, so we see that as a really key uh, way of delivering the public sector innovation and transformation that is needed. Because if public, domestic public financial flows are not supporting this agenda, then it really doesn't matter what international banks such as the MDBs can do. I'm happy to say more, or if you want to... I'll do one round, but I okay. do want to have a specific question for you that maybe you can reflect on and we can come back to it, because we're going to start to hear around the pipeline of projects that we have. The complaint that we have is still that there aren't enough projects out there, and in particular from the large MDBs, that most of those projects are too small, not necessarily big enough. So how, how can we break that down and ensure that we actually match demand with supply mm -hmm. and really start to shift? Yeah. So, I mean, we've been working with countries to take their NDCs and turn them into investment plans that create visibility around the projects. Um, of course, uh, I mean, as uh, multilateral banks, most of the projects we do are of a certain scale. 
But we do work, particularly in IDB, we work very closely with uh, financial institutions, both on the public sector. I mean, in Latin America, most public finance goes through national development banks. So we've been working to build their capacity and help them generate the project pipelines. So for example, in Mexico, we've been working with Bonobras, the big infrastructure development bank, uh, to integrate uh, our sustainable infrastructure framework so that they start to prioritize project pipelines that will create visibility for investors, which is something they've, you know, they've been working on for a while, that are aligned with different elements of sustainability, inc including alignment with the Paris Agreement, actually. So um, that is key. When you want to get to the smaller scale, we tend to work through financial intermediaries. That said, we do have, um, we have a trust fund within the IDB that is, uh, used to be called the Multilateral Investment Fund. It's now IDB Lab. Uh, that is working directly with micro, small, medium-sized enterprises and doing some amazingly innovative things. And the challenge there, though, is how do we replicate all that good practice? How yeah. do we, you know, we, we see really good uh, sustainable development solutions on the ground. How do we move more quickly to replicate that in other contexts? Okay. So we'll come back to that because I think that's incredibly important. Maybe moving on to the private sector side and knowing how much BNP Paribas has also been doing. Um, Hervé, can you maybe give us a little bit of, of your thinking? I know also that you've been introducing some new bonds, that you're also looking very much at sustainability and the SDGs and how you integrate that into your finance, please. Yes, uh, th <coughs> thank you. Um, there is a good news and a bad news. So. The good news is the way finance has transformed over the last five years. And the even better news is uh, I can bet or guarantee you that in the, within the next five years, sustainability will be part of 100% of finance. I'm not saying that 100% of, fin 100 of finance in five years will finance sustainable projects. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is sustainability will be part of the financial conversations in five years in every single instrument, whether it's a loan, a bond, or a derivative. And that's the transformation that finance has managed to do over the last five years. And it's twofold. One, uh, we've managed to create incentives, um, financial incentives, when we are financing sustainable projects or sustainable corporations. However, um, this is not enough because, the, as you mentioned earlier, the capi capital is here to finance whatever you want, from a coal plant to a wind farm. Um, and, and it's not the additional financial incentives that are enough. As, as someone said, actually, from BNP Paribas uh, on an earlier panel, um, today uh, the ROI may be on a renewable energy project might be 8% when continuing, continuing to drill down is 16%. Of course, if you take a longer term view, the view is that um, the 8% will be, look much more attractive than the 16% a few, few years down the road. But the problem is, today, um, while the capital is here, um, corporations and others have to choose those projects ver versus others. However, we've managed to create and financial... How do we make that happen? So we, collectively. The previous panel was about partnerships mm -hmm. and collaborations. Um, I think over the last five years, we've seen the private sector going pretty much ahead um, compared to the public sector um, overall. You see a lot of um, quite bold initiatives in the private sector. And to some extent, what we see in the public sector or in regulations is more stamping what the private sector has already been doing. Um, so I think it's a closer collaboration between private and public, and actually the other way around, where public now has to catch up on what the leaders in the private sector have been doing. Okay, so we're going to turn now to Bertrand, who obviously has a long pipeline of potential projects, and who can start to, maybe you can give us some of your experience in terms of the financing for those projects, and what has worked and what hasn't worked. First, I'd like to say how happy I am to be on a panel with you, Sandrine, you. because my father, 50 years ago, was a friend of Aurelio Pecce, mm. who created the Globe of Rome, and was telling me exactly what you said on the podium five minutes ago. Yeah, exactly. isn't it sad that it's taken this but long can to you be imagine, said again? <laughs> can you imagine that during 50 years, yeah. so little has happened? 
And we are now in the climate emergency that everybody could see already 50 years ago exactly. coming. Why is it like this? Mm. I think we focused on the wrong language. If you want to make a change, you should speak the language of the people we want to convince. And we have spoken for 50 years about the environment to people who don't care about the environment. We've spoken to people who had short-term views, and we spoke to them about the next generation. They don't care. We've spoken to people who deny climate change. And we bring the arguments about climate change. We're completely wrong. We're speaking a language that these people cannot understand. What is the language that a politician can understand? Employment, in order to have elections or electors. What is the language that business can understand? Profit. We should speak the language of employment and profit to the people that need to change something in this world. Because in this room, we know all about environment and climate change. It's useless to speak more and more about it between us. Now let's see which are the arguments that we need to convince the others. And there are things that protect the environment that are expensive. Forget them. There are things that are profitable and destroy the environment. Forget them. In the middle, you have a lot and a lot of opportunities that create jobs and make profits and protect the environment. Focus only on that. Focus only on that. And you'll have a fantastic tool. You'll have a fantastic leverage. And I see it every year, every day at the Solar Impulse Foundation. What do we do? We select technologies, products, devices, systems everywhere in the world, small startups to big corporations. And we see which one protect the environment, which one are technically feasible, and which one make profit. We select them, we assess them with experts, we put a label, Solar Impulse Efficient Solution label. And we work with BNP Paribas for the compliance to be sure that these companies are reliable. And with these tools, we go to governments, to cities, to corporations, and we tell them, look, you have long-term goals, but you don't know how to reach them. Here are the tools to do it. Very, very practical. So of course, when I was flying around the world with my solar-powered airplane, <clears throat> it was not down to earth, it was symbolic, it was philosophical, but now it's really very, very practical, very down to earth, and we have selected already 308 of these solutions, and we're on the way to select 1,000. Fabulous, and I, and I think, thank you for that. Before we move to Carlos, and I'm so appreciative of all the incredible work that, that you've been doing at Iberdrola, having worked with you also when uh, I ran the Prince of Wales Corporate Leaders Group, I wanted to add to Bertrand's very good point, because we all know we have the solutions, and in fact, Hervé has said the same thing. In fact, even Citra, when they put together their report last year, where they had 17 solutions, they said the only thing you needed to do was actually use 17% of the 548 billion that goes into subsidies. Fossil fuel subsidy elimination. Right now, you use 17% of those revenues and you could pretty much do what you've just said. And that is the appalling thing, is that we continue to allow the perversities in the market. We always talk about reinventing new things. We actually could just get rid of all of those perversities, like fossil fuel subsidies, like the continuation, actually, of investing in fossil fuel infrastructure, like the fact that we tax in labor instead of taxing products that are not green, so shift the taxation. These are some perversities that currently exist in the market that we should think about getting rid of. And one thing that Iberdrola and Acciona and others have always said, we don't necessarily need subsidies. Just create a fair market for us. Right, Carlos? Well, thank you, uh, Sandrine. And I will link with your, your, your speech uh, because I remind that not only uh, 
reminding what you are done, but also the, the, our story in the last 20 years is the motto that has been used in Costa Rica in the pre-COP. The, the, the motto was, who said it was impossible? This is the, 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 the motto for, for the pre-COP. And in, in our case, 20 years ago, uh, nobody obliged us, but we decided to follow some of the mega trends. Now we have a huge amount of mega trends uh, for the decarbonization, but it is, in this moment it was the Kyoto Protocol, and we decided to change completely the company, and we start to close our oil and coal plants, and we decided to invest in, in renewables, uh, mainly in wind energy. Uh, a lot of companies uh, say, hey, this is the, the, the company of the small w mills, you know, the, uh, in a despective way, but well, we keep on. Uh, and we, we also start to, to, to invest in, in, in hydro pump, uh, pumping units and, and, and so on. So at the end, now, how, 20 years later, how, how we are? Well, now we don't have coal, uh, neither oil, we have 31 gigawatts of uh, renewables. That is a huge amount. Uh, only two countries in, in, in South, South, South America uh, has more installed capacity, not renewables, installed capacity than our renewables uh, um, installed capacity. We are leading the wind production in the world uh, in this moment. Uh, we are leading the green finance uh, as a corporate uh, issuer. Uh, we have reduced 75% uh, our footprint we have commitment for 2020, 2030, and 2050. Uh, we need not only 2050, we need to uh, commitment to 2020 because all the managers, the, our chairman, will be there in order to, 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 to respond why we don't, don't succeed in that. Uh, because 2050, only focusing in that allows the greenwashing, you know, so, so we need this. And, we have multiplied all our parameters, our employees by four, our assets by six, uh, and we have demonstrated that the transition for the green economy that we have started 20 years ago is not only good for the planet and the citizen, but also for our shareholder, because 20 years ago, we, w we was 20th, the 20th company in market capitalization in the world, and now we are the, 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 the fourth. So, so our shareholders are very happy of uh, our transition to the green economy in the last year. For us now, it's not a, a revolution, it's an evolution because we keep on uh, adapting to the new technology that arise with the disruption and we take profit of that. So uh, this is important. There are some companies or some states that has put away this decision of uh, transforming their, their economies to the, to the decarbonization, but all the megatrends now are going in the same direction. And if you don't uh, take this direction, you will put away in, in, in the future. Completely agree. And, and I guess then the, the next question that we should be thinking a little bit about is one that, that was very, very well brought forward by, by Bertrand. First, and, and also actually, Amalni, you brought up the same, which is how do we ensure that we have this knowledge exchange and how do we communicate to people? How do we change the narrative? And so I'd like us to reflect a little bit on, about that and then open up for, for questions because I want us all to leave here with some new thinking as we go out there so that we really can go to scale, get the speed, and actually have the success that we need. If we look at just last week or several weeks ago, I was actually in Germany, and Bosch had given a really good example of how the CEO had gone in with a young scientist to the board, and the idea was that they were going to pull out of all, well, basically, they were going to go net zero by 2030. Mm -hmm. And already the CEO was pretty proud of himself, and he was patting himself on the back, and he went into the board thinking, okay, it's going to be tough, but we're going to get there. He went into the board with this young scientist, and by the end of the meeting, the board turned around and said, no, 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 we're not going to do this by 2030, we're going to do it by 2020. And he left thinking, holy shit, <laughs> how are we going to pull this off? And part of the reason was the young scientist who came in and said, we don't have the time. So now you just have to do it. And we know that young engineers, as well as not so young engineers, can innovate. So the fact is that we're starting to shift the bar and that some of these decisions, just like the EIB pulling out, even though they knew it was going to be tough, was a really difficult decision. How can we 
spur more of those difficult decisions? And then how can we communicate that to people to ensure that they understand that actually this can happen and it is happening, and here's how you can get on board to this really exciting journey. Do you have any thoughts on <laughs> Actually, I'm glad you asked that question. It's almost like we prepared it, but... Um, so actually, we just issued uh, last week this report uh, based on three years of working in Latin America, getting to net zero emissions, uh, where we've been working with six countries to create these uh, 2050 decarbonization pathways, deep decarbonization pathways. Uh, Costa Rica being the one most advanced, you probably, for those of you here last week, the president of Costa Rica announced it, and they have now a decarbonization plan that we're working with the government to help implement. But one of the key findings of the work and the analysis is, one, you need to build the capacity around these issues and the dialogue, very important dialogue, in country. So it's not a case of producing a nice model that you're going to then submit to the UNFCCC, although of course we are hoping that our, many of our countries in the region will submit their long-term strategies next year. But these strategies provide the long-term vision, get a long-term vision and then work backwards to understand what investment decisions should be taken now, today, not in 20 years, that are consistent with that pathway which will ensure they can make that transition in a smooth way, avoid stranded assets, and very, very importantly, I think as the point Bertrand met, um, ensure that that transition is really a just one. So we are seeing, and we're seeing this very much in Costa Rica, the other countries that we're working with, that these long-term strategies provide, if you like, the platform, the opportunity to bring the whole of society together around that vision. And that vision should be about the opportunities and the new jobs that are going to be created. In our, we've worked with the uh, ILO, the International Labour Organization, and, and we anticipate at least one million net additional jobs will be created through the low carbon transition in Latin America. So there are going to be opportunities, but it does require leadership of governments to engage with all, all parts of society. And I hope uh, we'll see youth in all countries starting to demand that in a way we're seeing in Europe in particular. I don't think it's quite as advanced in, La in our region as it is probably here in Europe, uh, but hopefully, I mean, Greta's been traveling the world. She didn't, unfortunately, didn't make it to Latin America, um, uh, but we are starting to see, and in fact, we had a great dialogue uh, last week with around 15 uh, representatives of youth who are all working in the region in different ways, trying to raise awareness, build engagement, support local communities uh, with even from you know, very sort of local resiliency solutions in Haiti to uh, trying to engage on this issue of just transition in Costa Rica. So, you know, I, I, yes, I hope that we are now at the turning point and that we will see the dialogue, as Bertrand said, this is about the new low carbon resilient development pathway. It's not that this, this cannot be about causing pain to people. It will no. never happen. Uh, absolutely. And so maybe can I just build on that and then bring in also Carlos and Hervé in terms of if we're going to look at, at fast public private partnerships, um, you know, some of the analysis that's been undertaken is that actually the finance sector is not brought in fast enough. So they're not part of the solution. They're always an end of pipe thinking. How do we, once you've got that feedback from the youth, from some of those projects, which might not be big enough, are you able then to either put them in touch with the private sector in order to fund some of those projects? Mm -hmm. Can you bundle? Um, do you bring in maybe some larger multinationals who are doing some of that work with the small... How does that work in practice? So I would... I mean, yes, it is about projects, but I also think it's also about systemic change. Um, Jean Leo, my colleague who's sitting back there, who's done amazing work this year, working with Chile and helping structure their sovereign green bond, um, uh, has launched and will launch here a report on how Latin American financial institutions are now really starting, quite rapidly starting to think about these issues and climate risk and regulation, obviously following on from the TCFD, but also, of course, very importantly, the opportunities. Dialogue is a key part of that. Now, the ex uh, regulation 
probably will be part of it, but before we get there, dialogue awareness raising is key. And we see a lot of more informal and even industry business-led yeah. self-supervision or self-regulation in Latin America, much more than probably in Europe or the US. So things are moving. Um, we, we're seeing that central banks, uh, Costa Rica, Mexico, we're working with Chile. I think Chile are going to be here this week. We're doing an event um, on exactly this because we're. I think we're starting to see quite uh, rapid movement from the financial sector. Okay, thank you for that. And we know that through the NGFS and the central banks are coming together as well. There's now an international platform that was started by the European Commission also around disclosure and the taxonomy. So clearly there is greater exchange. Carlos, do you have some good examples of how you feel that you've been able to collaborate in Latin America or other countries um, where you're trying to replicate some of that experience? Well, well we, 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 we know that all the work that we are making in the different aspects in, in, in our company are replicable in all the, all the rest of the world, you know? Uh, we, we are doing, for instance, the two biggest uh, photovoltaic plant in Europe. In, in, and the reduction of cost is not only uh, reduction of cost, but also in, in time, you know? You, we, we now uh, spend 12 months to construct a 500 megawatts uh, photovoltaic. Great. 500 is the half of the biggest uh, nuclear plant, you know? Uh, we have a problem with the uh, administrative processes because it remains the, the, the same than when constructing a, a nuclear plant. So we spend 12 months to construct the plant and we need three to four years to, to receive all the, the permits, you know? So uh, we try to, to convince the governments of the different jurisdictions of the same problem that we have here or, or, or in, in Brazil or, or in other places. Uh, we, we also uh, replicate the, the, the look for, the looking for remote synergies. Remote synergies, let me, let me explain you. Uh, remote synergies is some places or some relations that nobody has think in, uh, in, in the past. What's the case of uh, cheap yards in, in, in Spain? We talked five years ago that maybe replacing some of the processes, they can construct the big components that are called the jackets. Jackets are those uh, components that are in the sun, you know? Uh, and they, 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 they start uh, changing their processes and they, we contract them for, for the first time uh, and they succeed and they produce a very nice uh, construction of this element and now are running our uh, offshore plants in the Baltic Sea, Bikinger is running with this technology. They perform very well and we contract another one for uh, East Anglia one in the, the North Sea and we are con uh, contracting also for, for the, the, uh, the, the new plants that we will construct in Massachusetts. Uh, so these remote synergies are very relevant if we want to, to, to develop, to develop uh, exponential solutions because yeah. the, the climate change uh, has exponential problems. So, this experience of looking for uh, remote synergies are worldwide sp spread by us. I really like this remote synergies, and, and I hope that people are writing this down, because this is part of the just transition. There's some new work that's being done in Bulgaria, that's being done in Poland as well, in old industrial zones that are going to be abandoned, either from the movement of coal into other technologies and to optimize those zones. Because what do you do? You then build a community. Those communities have been around that zone forever. So if you're in a shipyard and you can actually use some of the technology that's there, revitalize that community, that speaks to the people. That's when you start to bring some of the people on board. And this is what we need to think about. This comes back to the systems thinking. Because we don't have to have brand new communities being developed in terms of digitalization brand new zones. What we need to do is to optimize existing zones and shift them into decarbonization and also new technologies. I don't know if you have any experience in that area, Hervé, or if you have some other thoughts that you wanted to bring yes, in. Uh, just uh, some uh, other thoughts. Um, in, uh, in finance, how we can scale and, and give incentives. And two, um, 
Bertrand's point, uh, in the space of finance, it's the language of money. And what we've done over the last five years is actually really talk about money when we speak about sustainability, to show to corporations that they can optimize their funding if uh, we are fun financing sustainable projects or we are financing fairly sustainable corporations. And this has been created in three ways. The first, the first one, which was kind of a gimmick, but it worked extremely well, um, was the green bond concept. Um, it's been to, the, the whole idea there was to tag a specific use of proceeds. And what we discovered as you do so, um, is that you create, um, you, you, uh, you, you make the emergence of an additional demand mm. of investors that were kind of hidden before, uh, sustainable investors, green bond investors. And this additional demand makes the price uh, of the bond better, uh, which is good for the borrower. So if you use the, the, the proceeds for a good cause, uh, you have a chance to finance your corporation cheap, more cheaply. And so that's the way you use the language of money to try to create the impact or outcome you, you want to have. So from green bond, we created social bonds, sustainable bond, blue bonds, gender bonds, vaccine bond, pandem pandemic emergency bond, rhino bond, transition bonds, and so on and so forth. Mm. So that's wave number one. Can, can I just ask you, Hervé, because we all know that actually the, the green bonds in particular are only 2% of the bond market. Yeah. How do we scale up all so those other bonds? It's kind of like beyond no, GDP, so, 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 you know? So, How do we scale up all so, the other indicators? So that was, that's <laughs> uh, phase one. I'm going to come to phase two and phase three. So it's a gimmick for reasons that are beyond this audience, but it was, it was great because thanks to that, uh, the financial community over the last five years discovered climate change. Six years ago, we had no clue. Mm. Um, it's important. So phase number two has been, and that's the real revolution, it's to tie a little bit of the interest rate to the sustainability impact that you have. So now we don't look at how what you do with the funds. You might even build a coal plant with it. Of course, it's uh, an extreme uh, uh, stupid uh, scenario. But if you manage to become carbon neutral or carbon negative by doing it, go ahead. So we did it with our Bedrola, where, where um, basically bank lenders are willing to um, receive a lower return, a little bit, if Iberdrola or Danone or Philips, all corporations that have done this, achieve some ambitious sustainability targets. And it's a revolution in the world of finance because for millennia, we've lent money at a rate that reflects ab the ability of the borrower to repay. For the very first time, there is a portion of that rate that relates to also to the ability of the borrower to do good. Mm. So mm. in this second phase, it's banks, banks only willing to give a little bit of money if you achieve um, some, uh, some sustainability improvement. The third phase really happened last September when um, another power utility, NL, we underwrote a bond, bond for them. Uh, so here it's no longer bank lenders, it's external investors. Uh, it's a five-year bond. Enel today has 46% of installed renewable energy capacity. If in two and a half years Enel has less than 55%, they will have to pay much more on their bond coupon. So it's very important because now, soon, sooner than later, Every investor in this room and beyond will realize that they can ask for more money in the future to BNP when we issue a bond, to General Electric when they issue a bond, to Capgemini if they issue a bond, or to IBM when they issue a bond for some sustainability performance. So be it uh, a reduction in greenhouse gas emission, be it more than 30% of women in, in upper management, you name it, now we've created a financial trick where any investor could ask for more money in two and a half years or whatever if the borrower doesn't meet some sustainability targets. So these are ways uh, that finance has created. Yeah. But once again, it's not because the means are here that people will choose to do the right thing. Yeah, so that's, that's where we need to get to next, is how can we make sure people choose it. Bertrand, do you have a few thoughts before we move out into the audience? I already have some hands that have been showing over here. Oh, boy. Okay. For, for a long time, I have to admit that I was a big fan of international agreements. And I <laughs> thought that all the individual initiatives would never be enough. 
and that we needed to work on the international collaboration and consensus. But today I see it completely wrong. Each time I go in the rooms of the negotiators, it reminds me a story my father was telling me. He, he loved history. You know that in 1453, when the Ottomans attacked the city of Constantinople, they were climbing on the walls, burning the entrance of the city. What was the city council doing at that moment? They were not defending the city. They were discussing the gender of the angels. <laughs> were the angels <laughs> males or females? And during that time, the invaders were destroying the city. <laughs> I had exactly this impression when I was listening to the negotiators arguing about the periods and the commas I agree. on Article 6, this yes. famous Article 6. Now, the question is, was so, the period or the comma a female or a male? It's exactly this. It's exactly this. And you know the result is that if we had started at COP15, we would have had to cut 3.5% of CO2 emissions per year to reach the target. If we do it today, we have to cut 7.45% of CO2 emissions to reach the IPCC target. And because we do not start today, because the negotiators are pushing that longer and longer, we will need to cut 10% per year to reach the target. So obviously, it does not work. And I have to admit that I was wrong, and I pledge guilty. Now, the other thing that really makes me optimistic are all the impacts of the individual initiatives, the banks that are starting to change the way they invest, the way industries are changing the way they deal with waste, with energy, the way people building houses are changing the way they build the houses. The people making energy change. Abdel Jola, I'm a big fan of you. I was flying with solar impulse above your concentration solar uh, power plants in Spain. It's just fantastic. When you see all this, I have to say that it speeds up in an exponential way. Mm. It's exponential. And I never thought a few years ago that individual initiatives could make such a difference, but it does. So maybe we have to focus on this now. Yeah, and let's, let's make sure that we're more strategic so that we have more of them. So I'm going to go back and forth because I have a lot of different questions. I'm going to let Joachim start. And then I've got a, a lovely lady in the back over there in the green shirt. I think it's green. Great. Uh, Jochen Wermuth, I'm an impact uh, investor focusing on climate. You're part of the impact investing network globally. I'm a member of the German Sovereign Wealth Fund Investment Committee and part of Divest Invest Globally, which exploded largely. Here's question. the question. Apologies. German environmental agency established that the damage we cause with one ton of CO2 is 640 euros over the next 100 years. 640. German government is inducing a price of 10. If you think about emerging markets, an investment in a reforestation will cost you six euros a ton, right? So my investment in an emerging market, I don't have to worry about if I lose 10 or 20% in currencies or political crisis because I'm buying a ton of CO2 at one hundredth the cost that I'm causing. So my challenge is we should ourselves adopt a price of 640 euros a ton for our own emissions because we can afford it. And we can do it just if we let people have the money up front. Whatever you charge in a carbon tax, you give them up front. You get 6,400 euros on day one of the year. If you consume as usual, you spend it on tax. You save, you get it back. So my question to you is, should we not finally ourselves, at least in the northern hemisphere, accept the right cost, the cancer, allergies, asthma, climate damage of 640 euros, which you can no longer discount as we have so far. Thank okay, you. thank you. I'm going to take a few questions in the back. Can someone give her a microphone, please? And we've got an extra microphone here. Maybe we can just pass that one around. I don't know if there's someone else that can help. Yes, please, go ahead. 
My name is Katrin Gansen from Urgewald. I'm an NGO looking at finance, mainly trying out to dry out finance for the grey economy. And that's why my question is to Mr. Dutte from BNP Paribas. Um, at the moment, there are more than 200 companies uh, planning new coal plant power plants with a total capacity of 500, 570 gigawatt, which is about a third of what is the installed capacity today. And we know also from Mr. Guterres, there shouldn't be any new coal power being built next year. And we found that behind this coal plant developers are investors and banks uh, giving fresh capital of 745 billion US dollar, and the biggest creditor in Europe is BNP Paribas. So um, I wonder, I know your asset management department introduced some exclusion policies already for coal, and I wonder when the lending side of BNP Paribas will follow on excluding fossil, especially coal companies, okay. and not project Thank you. finance. Thank you very much. This gentleman here, moving up to the front. Are there any other women, by the way, who want to ask a question? Okay. <laughs> lovely, Thank lovely you. gentleman, I guess, right? You're, you're a lovely gentleman, <laughs> too. I have no problems with gentlemen. I'm just trying to be slightly fair. Sorry. <laughs> so my name is Mahan Chabai. I work for GE, and I, I chair REAP as well. So I have two thoughts, if you can give me feedback on that. So when we speak about energy capacity, there are three things. is the hardware, is the services, and the digitalization. We speak a lot about the capacity insta uh, installed. We speak less about the best use of the capacity that we have. And that you will have is through digitalized services. So each time we speak about finance, we need to get it part of that discussion. Mm. Second thing is how to make the corporates understand our thoughts and the importance of climate. It's very simple. Corporates, they listen to investors. Investors look at revenues, growth, and profitability. Then our action should be towards the investors and the analysts in the way they evaluate companies, not only on revenues, not only on profitability, not only on growth, but also on sustainability or socioeconomic benefits they can bring. If we put that in place, we get it as a standard, then the corporates will react differently. Okay, so I'm gonna take one last one here and then I'll go back out to a series of other questions. And then we'll My name is Morten Björk. I'm a serial entrepreneur from the country of Greta. I'm also the commercial coordinator for commercializing uh, Swedish innovations in China. We use a business model. We build on operate transfer mode, supported by government guarantees, where we then become customers to sister companies, started in the companies where we can develop the, the operation and, and, the, and uh, the, the localized production to Swedish innovation companies, thereby through positive cash flow, uh, reducing the need to inject more money in startups to provide the technologies. Your now, question finance is, is there. Now, my question is, the only thing missing to state and prove the cases is the feasibility studies. So how can we provide the finance for the feasibility studies proving the cases? Because once we got them, there's no problem to get finance. Okay, thank you so much. Some thoughts from, so I think there was one directed directly to you, Hervé, <laughs> so maybe you yes. can at least start. And then, uh, Carlos, you want, you want to say a few things as well. So... First of all, the, the, the numbers in the study are far, uh, far from correct, and <coughs> read the press with the BNP statement, but uh, we're exposed to no more than 10 companies uh, and not the number that you're mentioning. So several things. The first is BNP Paribas has stopped financing any coal projects since 2016. Uh, we still uh, had uh, continued to finance some diversified groups uh, under strict um, uh, criteria. Now, a week or two weeks ago, the group announced that we would be uh, not financing any company uh, that would still be exposed uh, uh, to coal uh, in 2030 in Europe and 2040 uh, out in the rest of the world. Um, the last thing I would mention, um, the, um, the expo one thing that we m monitor very carefully year after year is the uh, percentage of coal that we finance in the electricity mix that we finance. So the world electricity mix um, is about 38% of coal. For the very first time, we were below 20%. And remember, we do finance uh, companies that are exposed to coal and that uh, also are uh, diversified industrial groups. Um, so it's an illusion to think that uh, a company like BNP Paribas that has probably $2 trillion on balance sheet of lending um, 
is not cannot be exposed to companies uh, that are highly diversified. This being said, we have not been involved um, in the financing of any coal projects since 2016. Um, and again, we have a very strict policy to not be exposed to any type of company and that would have more than 0% of coal uh, by 2030 in Europe and by 2040 in uh, the rest of the world. Okay, I think it needs to go a bit faster, to be fair, <laughs> um, especially if the MDBs are going to start pulling out. I know it's tough because our economies are totally dependent on fossil energy, but the fact is, in the next decade, we need to reduce our emissions by 50%. So let, I, me, let me add one more uh, yeah. thing. Uh, two or three years ago, we've been the only major bank to stop the financing of oil or gas coming from shale. Mm. Um, so I'm not accusing BNP. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying the system sucks. <laughs> so, you know, that's basically it. The finance system, I know, I've just been told I have three minutes, and we could go on for hours, but I need to let these guys respond to the other questions. Okay, and then I'll take yours very quickly because I only have three minutes. But it has to be a question, not a comment. Yes. I'm happy to take the question about the CO2. I completely agree that we have to pay for the externalities of the CO2 and the damage we're doing. If we do it on a global level, we need an agreement between everybody. And this is what I told you I don't really believe in anymore. But there is a model in the CO2 tax that I love, and it's already been done. Uh, one of the states in Canada, I think it's British Columbia, maybe another one, but it works. You pay for the amount of CO2 you produce, and this amount, the total amount is divided between the number of people who have paid and redistributed. So if I emitted less that I have paid, no, if I, no, sorry, if I have emitted less than what other people have emitted, I get money back. Okay. And why is it so important? It's because at that moment, you, for the first time, you introduce the just transition. Mm. And when you see what happens in France with the yellow vest, exactly. you see that you cannot just do an ecological uh, action without having the poor against yeah. you. Yeah. So if you can do, at the same time, the taxation of the CO2, at the same time you give money to the people who need money, and at the same time it's an incentive to produce less CO2, because you know that if you produce less CO2, then you'll have money back, you touch all three problems at once. And I'm a huge fan of that system. And this you can do it in a country. You don't need to do it globally, uh, internationally. Okay, you can hold even on, do it Carlos for a state. Carlos needs to can go next. He's been wanting to say something. I just want to add to that again. Get rid of the perversities in the market first. We don't have to invent anything new if we get rid of those perversities. And that means shifting the tax on labor to products. Next, and then next, and then I'm going to get totally massacred by Peter, who's really upset with me. Uh, having this very high price for, for CO2 is very relevant. But I, I, I would say that for me, is more important, uh, another driver is that air quality. Air quality is very, very uh, agile, more than 200 countries deciding uh, a protocol, and has in, in hand, is in hands of, of very agile administration, you know. And the cost of decarbonization has to be included also the other, no CO2, the, but the other pollutants. And another thing is that when you have this signal that very high price for CO2 or other uh, uh, carbon uh, problems, you, you, you have to, uh, a very less risky decision for your investment. That's the case, for instance, in Longan, it was our biggest coal plant in, in UK. And five years ago, we defend to have a floor, a floor for the price. And this leads, we succeed defending that, and this leads that we have to close the plant because of that. And this is, w w they are crazy, no? Because that supports the renewal, the rest of, of our portfolio, and give up credibility in the decision that we have had. Thank you, Carlos. Very so, quickly, Amali. Yeah, just on that, because I know that obviously the social cost of carbon is something that's kind of economists have never been able to agree on. But I also think it's really important. We're using old economic models and instruments to try to transform our economies. So we just, very quick example, in Costa Rica, we've done a cost-benefit analysis looking at avoided costs of congestion and avoided health, negative health impacts. 
in shifting to electromobility and improving public transportation. And we find 3.8% of GDP in terms of benefits. This is using non-traditional cost-benefit analysis. Yes. So we have to, economists have to start to innovate as well. And yeah. it's about taxation, but it's also yeah. about things like cost-benefit analysis. So Donut Economics, the Stern Report. I mean, there are so many good economic reports that are starting to say that exactly what I just said, the system sucks. We need to rethink it, both in terms of finance and in terms of economics. The Club of Rome has been saying this for a long time as well. We have many publications out there. This is part of what you were saying as well, that you need to build the short-term shift into a long-term systems paradigm shift. And you need both. Now, I know this lovely lady really wanted to say something, but I am getting so many. Now, if you can say, can I let her say something, Peter, or should I just, yes? And then I go, and then but I we go. Can, we okay. can make the cocktail five minutes shorter, and we speak here for five minutes more. I agree, because it seems everybody is. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm from the Galapagos Islands. I guess you are almost almost everybody knows that uh, uh, a military base has been open a couple of weeks ago. I've been all over the world because of my profession, which is tourism and science, and I create something as a contribution for the planet, which is an alphabet of values, principles, ethics, and morals. That's why we need to work. And corruption is what is taking where we are right now. So it's altruism, benevolence, consistency, dignity, effort, faithfulness, gratitude, honesty, integrity, justice, karma, loyalty, moderation, neutrality, order, punctuality, respect, solidarity, unity, and tolerance. So uh, I was born, as I say, in the Galapagos Islands and in Ecuador, my country, especially in Quito. This alphabet is already working very well in the students in the schools. And I also create an, uh, um, an, an anthem of values. And now I'm working with the government, too, in order to build the first avenue of values in the world. So if there's also any corporation, a bank, that will help me invest and create an avenue of values as a contribution on our planet. Great. So to build on this lovely finale, because I think that is the greatest reminder for all of us. Number one, please go to the GABV. I'm happy to put you in touch. They are the Association of Banking for Values. So I think some of them might be happy to work with you. Secondly, I'm happy through the Club of Rome to work with you on this new alphabet. We've been talking about the fact that there's a total loss of moral compass. Whatever your morality is, your spiritual following is, it doesn't matter. Somehow we're allowing hate and a continuation of the perpetuation of inequality to take over the world. So could not agree with you more. There are unbelievable solutions, as we've heard, and there's a need to speak truth to power. The fact that so many of you got engaged in this conversation shows that you're fed up with the usual conferences that don't actually talk about the reality of what we're facing. We need to have more of these discussions. Have them at home, have them with your colleagues, have them at work, have them in international fora. Again, be the leader that you want to see and speak truth to power. The only way we're going to turn this thing around in the next 10 years is for us to really, really hike up our efforts, collaborate, and be real, and hold those that are not willing to pick up on all these incredible solutions, to commend the MDBs, to commend those that are actually really trying to do the right thing in terms of the companies that have shifted out of coal, that have shifted out of high carbon, we need to hold those accountable, and we need to get out of here and start doing it now. Thank you very much. So just as the photo is happening, if you could all just stay seated, just, just a couple of closing words. Uh, a, just a recap of the day, the new thinking and the new numbers you should have gathered, and then a closing message from our host. So first I'm going to hand over to Absa, who's going to give you two to five minutes on what happened in that room. I'm going to give you two to five minutes what happened in this room, and then there's beer. Okay? That's a great pleasure. That's a great picture. Now it's time to act.
N'est-ce pas, Christine? I'm my sister. <laughs> my hat. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> well done. I think everybody is tired. I'm not go we're not going to, uh, to make a... I want to invite our great panelists, our outstanding panelists to continue the discussion over here. Thank you so much for your contribution. As I said, I'm not going to wrap up. We know uh, what's need to be done. We started in our session locally, taking my hat off uh, Deputy Dele Dele Chief of Delegation from my country, Burkina Faso, coming from NDCs to LDCs, bring it local. What does this mean for our people? We talk about the mining sector, how to make it responsible, that is already good that the industry is taking it in account. And also the power of the consumer, the end user, who can curve the path of the, the route that we're taking. Finance is not the issue. Again, you heard it here. What is the problem? You said that the global south need to be responsible. We take measures. We're organizing ourselves. We're paying consultancy firms like uh, Ernest and Jung, just to take the example of the blue fund of the Bassin du Congo, that more than 100 projects is in the pipe, valued at six billion. Those are concrete examples. It means that the private sector is on the driving seat and the consortium from the global north can work, consortium of companies can work with the system company on the global south. And also decentralization, decentralizing the finance, the capacity building locally. Whatever you do is down there. You, the local people don't buy in you cannot grow your business. This is the things that everybody knows. It's time to just go and do business because we are waiting for you to do business. That is the, uh, and winning the heart of each other, it means trust. What we're still lacking is trust. And Christine is right. We were here and with the, with the, all, all, all the room was full of Africans. We want to be part of the global value chain. That's the only thing. Upgrade the informal sector to the next level, making them formal. And share the profit. Profit is not a dirty word. We can do it with ethics. So I will stop there and uh, let you uh, wrap up because let's go and work together. In Africa, we say, if you want to go, Fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So let's go together. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. Over to you. Excellent. It was a pleasure. And we want to recap the day with the, sort of the new thinking and the new facts that will hopefully make you do something different on Monday. So in our, in our room here, we started off with a quest for ambition and clarity. And one of the biggest new bits of clarity I, I, I heard was like, what are you doing for the temperature of the planet? What are you doing that's connected to the Paris Agreement? Um, McKinsey had a, a great presentation with 10 things to do. Nobody's going to remember 10. There was four groupings there. Energy efficiency, the forgotten fuel. Electrify all power sources and take it to a zero carbon grid. Forests, reduce deforestation and, and eliminate it, and then reforestation aggressively. And then don't forget the non-CO2, the nitrous oxides in the ag. And who would now forget the Republic of Cow if you were in her presentation? Um, that's methane. Um, the next piece was the capital task. Real clarity from the capital task. IIGCC said 23 trillion negative over the next 80 years for not sorting this stuff out, and 26 trillion in economic benefit by sorting it out in a far shorter time frame. Then we had the climate policy initiative saying we've crossed the half a trillion level, but 44% of it's coming from government. And that, since the size of the government pie is too small anyway to solve this, we know that, that both numbers are wrong. In fact, IPCC said 1.6 to $3.8 trillion per annum going in, and that's just to energy, with spending needed on adaptation and resilience and all the other pieces that came up during the day. 
So that was the key piece on clarity that I think was new and more clear than we started with today. The second piece was the sort of the fundamentals of this decade to deliver. And we, st we had some great sessions on technical possibilities through to business action, creating political will. But more important than political will was political possibility, intent, and then follow through. Actually putting in incentives in place and monitoring what was happening. So really what we found was that there's economic fundamentals we're all shooting for. There's this absolutely reliable downward curve from top left to bottom, bottom right on cost and time, which is the cost of clean. It's becoming cleaner, more abundant, and cheaper to do clean tech. And the speed of IT, as once one person called it, is pulling that cost curve down as well. Internet of Things, it's all pulling down this reliable cost curve. And then we've got the other piece, the squiggly upward brown curve. That's a commodity. It gets dirtier, more expensive, and harder to dig things out of the ground. So look at the curves. They're crossing over. And all, we, all we're all collectively trying to do is work out what's on the left and how do we get it to what's on the right. Once it's on the right, it's past the crossover, and we have an economic inevitability, and money will go at scale. But at the moment, we've got too much stuff on the left and, and, and not enough on the, on the right. So we talked about how to move it, the speed of IT, the price on carbon, getting that down. You have one minute left. We there we go. Show. And then one minute to between that and beer. So how to ramp up and who with? All sectors necessary, none sufficient. I, I, I liked uh, Cyril's thing. Luckily, the walls are disintegrating, and cross-sector pollination is everything. There was over a trillion dollars in the room that said we want, we prefer climate finance uh, models to climate to, to finance models. So, now what? To close, work out what we're doing differently on Monday so you don't didn't waste your Sunday. Purpose, top-down vision and mission that is Paris Agreement compliant. Otherwise, you're not anchored to your why. Prioritize. Do these follow? Do your priorities follow? Otherwise, this will not happen. And potential, get vivid on what's happening. Words matter, one-year targets, five-year targets, 10-year targets, and net zero by when. And then performance, get your to-do list based on that. Pay yourselves on how good you are to the Paris Agreement. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Thank Great. you. Great, lovely. So it's a busy day for all of us. I'm just going to hand, hand over to close the day, Jens Nielsen, um, our, our host of the day. And of course, uh, good. we want to thank Capgemini. I'm sorry we were still on the solution base. I want to thank all the sponsors. So over to you. Thank you. What a fantastic day. What a fantastic crowd. I would like to thank everyone for coming today. As you all know, the next 10 years are crucial if we're going to achieve the Paris Agreement. Back in 2010, in Cancun, we promised 10 years of World Climate Summit. And since then, we've been to Bern, Doha, Warsaw, Lima, Paris, Marrakesh, Bonn, Katowice, and now Madrid. We believe that World Climate Summit has had a strong impact on bottom-up climate action. So looking ahead, I would now like to promise another 10 years of World Climate Summit in order to support the efforts of the SDGs and the Paris Agreement. As we continue to hear the dire future that may be before us, we hope that we can contribute to the solutions and play a part in the decade to deliver on climate action. Or we hope to see you all in Glasgow next year. And now we're getting to the close of the more serious part. And I'm proud to announce that Cap Gemini is our sponsor of the evening reception. And I would like to welcome Jean Baptiste Perrin to the stage to open this reception. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask Consuelo, Carol, and Florent to join me on stage since we'll take only two minutes to close this session. Um, I have the easiest job, which is to officially invite this uh, 500 uh, peep crowd to uh, our cocktail in a second. Uh, I would like to take a minute to thank the World Climate Limited team, the World Climate Summit organization team, for such a great event for a couple of reasons. A, it was extremely hard to transfer the full Santiago de Chile event into uh, Madrid in less than weeks. B, thank you for making this event free. I know a lot of side events or you have to pay for it and 
We were extremely happy to have so many students from Madrid to uh, come here uh, uh, on a banking holiday uh, and to benefit from everything. And uh, C for giving us this opportunity. So a big round of applause to World Climate <laughs> Summit team. Um, during the cocktail, during the reception, we would be delighted to tell you about a couple of our thought leadership assets. Uh, Florent, our expert here, can tell you a lot about uh, energy transition. You heard him this morning. He can tell you about a lot of stuff. Carole represents our innovation agency, Fahrenheit. She has uh, written a very powerful a series of uh, uh, thought leadership, and this clean growth brochure is really a good one. I can uh, manage to find Carol in the crowd uh, to tell uh, everyone about uh, this powerful brochure. And Consuelo, right here, she's from our uh, design agency in Madrid, and uh, she's uh, currently building a planet-centric design approach, and I'm sure that it will be uh, lovely for you to uh, engage uh, with her. Thank you very much, everyone, and please enjoy.